Hey guys, welcome to Hip Use History as we travel back to December 16th, 1773. We're gonna go to Boston, Massachusetts and have a little bit of a tea party. How about that? I hope you're thirsty. Thirsty for the learning. So why don't we examine exactly what was the Boston Tea Party, how it exactly it occurred. And if you're a kid in school, you know we're gonna look at the consequences. So why don't we giddy up for the learning and go get her done right now. All right, guys, a little bit of backdropping before we get to the big night, December 16th, 1773. And really, we can start in 1733 in terms of the first time the British Parliament is going to pass a tax, that be it an indirect tax, on the American colonists. It's called the Molasses Act. And six pence per gallon, my friend. And this wasn't a tax designed to raise revenue. It was really a tax that was designed to protect large plantation owners in the British West Indies from French competition. But the effect is going to be that it's going to raise prices on molasses in the Northeast, where it's primarily being manufactured into product, and it's going to hurt the New England economy. So this is where we get the roots of boycott, of buying local, of the black market, of smugglers. It's not so much a philosophical opposition to the tax. It's really a pure economical opposition to the tax. So it doesn't really have the intended effect. And now we get the French and Indian War. And of course, the French and Indian War is going to have a devastating effect on the British economy. It's going to double their debt. And not to mention, at the end of the war, the British are going to decide to keep 10,000 red boots on the ground. Um, it was thought that they might take those soldiers home. But in 1763, we have a Native American uprising called Pontiac's Rebellion. And the British Crown decided, no, we're going to keep boots on the ground. And this means there needs to be revenue. Revenue to pay back the debt for the war and revenue to keep those soldiers home. So with the Molasses Act expired in 1764, the British Parliament's going to pass another indirect tax called the Sugar Act. And now this actually cut the tax on molasses in half, but it provided for stricter enforcement. And it's that stricter enforcement that's really going to be kind of a feather in the goose of the colonists. That made no sense. They're not going to like it so much. And really, this is where the beginnings of the Sons of Liberty begin to formulate with James Otis and Samuel Adams really organizing boycotts of the sugar tax, um, a push to buy local. Now, unfortunately for the British, there was also a downturn in the colonial economy when the Sugar Act was passed, and many of the colonists pointed to this sugar tax as being the culprit. It was probably because the war economy of the French and Indian War had ended, but nevertheless, the truth doesn't matter. It's what people think is the truth. So this really began begins at least the roots of the revolution in terms of people like James Otis and Samuel Adams forming the Massachusetts Whigs, which is going to really become the Sons of Liberty. So that tax isn't going to do so well. In 1765, we get another tax. What are you thinking, British? Now, we had indirect taxes, but we had nothing like the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act is a direct tax. They need to raise money. This is how they're going to do it. Every time you have a legal document, a newspaper, a magazine, my goodness gracious, playing cards, you have to put the funky stamp on there, which is going to cost you a pence. So if these indirect taxes didn't anger the American people, this direct tax is going to affect the personal livelihood of every single American colonist. And this is really going to put energy into the gas tank of the Sons of Liberty, of the Massachusetts Whigs, of this idea of no taxation without representation. It's not just an economical problem at this point. It's also a social political problem. So by 1766, even the British Crown knows the Stamp Act is no good, so they go ahead and repeal it. But at the same time, they're going to pass something called the Declaratory Act, which basically says we have the right to pass laws on the colonies, go blow it out your nose. So the next step towards the Boston Tea Party is in 1767 when the British Parliament passes the Indemnity Act. And this is an act designed to help the British East India Company. It's a large multinational corporation. It's British. They need help. And they were paying a 25% tax on the tea that they brought to England. And the deal is going to be that they're going to get a 25% refund for any tea that is then shipped to the colonies. Now, of course, that revenue needs needs to be made up, and that's going to be made up in the same year, 1767, when the Parliament passes the Townsend's Act. This is going to be a tax on paper, on glass, on paint, and on, you guessed it, the most commonly consumed beverage in North America, tea. And this didn't go over so well. 
From 1767 to 1770, we have a growth in the resistance. Groups like the Sons of Liberty are gaining influence. They're starting to talk to other colonies in terms of the idea of being against these taxes, not just for economic reasons, but for political reasons. No taxation without representation. We had no say in these taxes. So by 1770, the British crown has heard these complaints. They know it's serious. So they repeal most of the taxes but they're not going to repeal the tax on tea. They wanted to keep at least one tax in there to show the colonists, in a sense, we're in charge. Now, we're going to keep the ball rolling. In 1772, the Indemnity Act is going to expire. This was that 25% refund that the British East India Company was getting. Now, they're tightening the economic belt here. The British are only going to refund them 10% for tea that is brought to the colonies. But they're also going to raise taxes on tea in England. And this is going to have a devastating effect on the British East India Company. When prices go up, you know, sales go down, and now they're going to have a huge surplus of tea. Now, the British government wants to save the British East India Company. Now, the East India Company actually wanted to eliminate the Townsend's Act, but the Townsend Act, the tax on tea, was going directly to pay for colonial governors and judges. Now, this is also, in a sense, a form of control. They're not being paid by colonial assemblies. They're being paid by the crown, in a sense, through this tax, so the control comes from England. This was another Another reason groups like the Sons of Liberty were opposed to these forms of taxes because they were being used to pay officials, which meant those officials were not being paid and being used to represent the colonists themselves. So now we have brought ourselves to 1773, and the British Crown thinks they figured it out, and in 1773 they pass the Tea Act. Now, the Tea Act is going to, number one, fully do that 25% refund for the British East India Company. It's going to keep the tax on tea in the colonies, three pence per pound, my boy. But it's also going to take out the middleman. The British East India Company always had to go to Great Britain and then bring the tea from there to here. Now they can bring the tea directly to the port. That means they're going to have more profit. But the colonists, they don't like this one bit. They see this as a form of control, not only this idea of no taxation without representation, but now, in a sense, they're being used to bail out a huge British company, and that British company is monopolizing that industry of tea. And if they can monopolize the tea industry, who says they can't monopolize every part of the American economy. So we're getting closer, guys. That was a lot to go through, but now we're in 1773. Oh, what a night. Late December on December 16th, 1773. Let's do it. So in the fall of 1773, the British East India Company is going to pack seven ships with 2,000 chests of over a half million pounds of tea headed for North America. Four of the ships to Boston, one to Charleston, one to New York, and one to Philly. But at this point, the colonial opposition is well organized, and there is incredible pressure on these merchants on consignment that are going to take the tea to not take the tea. And that happens in Charleston. It happens in New York and Philly, where the boats are turned around. But in Boston... It was the sons of the royal governor who are going to be the merchants on consignment. And they're not going to reject the tea, but they're also not going to be able to pick it up. So in late November, the Dartmouth arrives. Uh, later, the Eleanor and the Beaver are going to arrive. The William was destroyed at sea. But on November 29th of 1773, Sam Adams is going to have a huge meeting in Boston to discuss what needs to be done about this situation. And it's agreed that something drastic needs to be done. We don't know quite what it's going to be, but they're demanding that this tea be returned to Great Britain, and they're sending 25 armed men down to the docks to protect those ships from having the tea being taken off the ships. And that stalemate is going to exist in 2 December, the big night, December 16th, 1773, where Sam Adams is going to have one big meeting with over 7,000 people, and many people think that he gave the signal for the Boston Tea Party with the words to the effect of, 
uh, this meeting can do no more to solve our problem. And that's where action occurred. Now, we don't have a lot of primary documents. It was thought that these people that participated anywhere from 30 to 150 were sworn to secrecy for 50 years. So there's not a lot of personal accounts of the Boston Tea Party. But they did dress as Mohawk Indians. It wasn't a very good attempt, but they took charcoal and put it on their faces and feathers in their caps. And they grabbed some tomahawks and they marched down to the docks. Now, one of the ideas is that they were dressing as Native Americans, not so much as a disguise, but to make a point that they were identifying with being American and not British. Now, the actual Boston Tea Party lasted for about three hours. This big group divided themselves into three groups, smaller groups, where they got onto the boats. There was no resistance. And remember that the Boston Massacre had occurred in 1770, so British soldiers were not so commonplace at that point in Boston. And they used their tomahawks, and they bashed open the chest of tea, and they dumped all that tea, about a million dollars worth of tea in today's money, into the Boston Harbor to make a point that the American colonists weren't going to take it any more from the British Parliament. And now we got a fight on our hands. How about that, boys and girls? Because you know the British Parliament's not going to be like, oh, they dumped it in the bay. Oh, that's terrible. Let's move on. Nope, there's going to be consequences. So why don't we look at those consequences right about now? <laughs> consequences are going to be harsh and the justice is going to be swift. Now, the intention of the coercion acts or the intolerable acts as called by the colonists was to make an example out of the Massachusetts colony. The British Empire wanted to show the other colonies this is what happens when you get out of line with the British Empire. So number one, we get the Boston Port Act. No business for you. We're going to close the Boston Port. The Massachusetts Government Act. No representation for you. We're going to kind of kill the colonial assemblies. The Quartering Act, which gave British soldiers permission to take um, up residence where there was none available for them. No housing for you. And finally, the Administration of Justice Act, which is going to move many trials off American soil into the British realm. So this isn't going to go over very well. The resistance is just going to get stronger. And this is really going to lead to the First Continental Congress, where the colonies are going to meet and they're going to agree to defend each other. And of course, eventually, that's going to bring us to Lexington and Concord and the sparking of the Revolutionary War. So there you go, guys. That was a lot of talking for the Boston Tea Party, but you can see that it's much more layered and complex than just a bunch of colonists dressing up as Native Americans and going to town on a ship with some tea. So we hope that your brain's a lot bigger, and we certainly hope that if you haven't subscribed to Hip Hughes History, you do that right now, or you forever face the consequences. There's really no consequences. You just really should subscribe. How about that? And I'll say it because I say it at the end of every lecture I've ever given. I'm going to say it right now because I mean it with all my heart. Where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you guys next time that you press my buttons.